Hello and welcome to Mr. Whitman's minimalist run of Laura Bow 1, The Colonel's Bequest. I had previously done a minimalist run on this game, however it came to my attention that it was not a true minimalist run, as there was in fact some less that I could do in this game. That being the case, I have revised this minimalist run, now with better narration, and uh, with the absolute minimum that can be done in this game. Now one word of caution, because I'm doing this as a minimalist run, there are going to be a lot of periods of time where I'm just standing around waiting. I will try to make this entertaining to you by speaking out, but there it's not going to be a whole lot of excitement here. But hey, if I had to put through this three times over to finish up with this, thing, you can deal with it once. Now, here of course is our first uh, encounter with Gertie and Clarence. Which, when you get to know this game better, you'll kind of realize that when you actually uh, encounter the person who's going to die next, that's what will cause the... <coughs> no, excuse me. That's what will cause the clock to go ahead 15 minutes. Although, as you can also see here, it's not just the one who dies next. Now we'll advance the clock. And really, part of the thing about this minimalist run is that it really does leave you barely conscious. That's what they say at the end of the game, anyway. And, yeah, it's true. You don't actually learn anything about anyone's motives to kill anyone. You don't learn anything about any of the characters. Um, in fact, in this minimalist run, you don't really encounter anyone who's died. Now, this one here, the uh, encounter between Fifi and Henry, this goes into your notes. Regardless of whether you want it to or not, it doesn't matter if you eavesdrop on them. Once you've seen that, it goes into your nose that these are people who are romantically involved. Uh, it is completely unavoidable. Oh, and in case you're wondering here, what I'm waiting for is for Gertie to finally go to her room. <clears throat> And, of course, this is where you get the first big waiting situation. And, yes, I waited in this hallway with the incessant ticking of the clock. The tick-tock, tick-tock. Also, trying to make this particular part a little more exciting for you, I go and explore the house. Also, uh, what I was really doing here is waiting for Jeeves to show up, asking if you'd like a drink, or if Wilbur would like a drink. Why he never offers one to Laura is beyond me. Maybe it's because she's under 21 and he knows it, but I don't know. But anyway, the reason I wait for Jeeves to offer a drink is because... This actually helps uh, Gertie to leave the room a little bit faster. And I do mean only a little bit faster. Yeah, so everybody's been standing around talking. And now here's where I got the idea to try to make the game faster, but I forgot exactly how that is done. So... Let's make the game go faster to cut down on uh, the wait time of the game. She's still not gone? Believe me, this is not a speed run. If I was doing a speed run, I could finish this game in less than half the time that I finish it in this one. In fact, if any of you would like to see a speedrun of Laura Boat 1, The Colonel's Bequest, I would be most willing to do that. Finally, Gertie's gone. 
So, of course, we can start up the stairs. Really, doing the Minimalist run in this game, you actually miss out on more than so many other games that you could play. I, I think part of that is that this game was not all about copyright protection. Oh yeah, and here we are, uh, seeing Gertie lying down asleep. And that's the last you'll ever see of her. That's probably the last you're ever going to see of this room, if memory serves. Now, as I was saying about copy protection, uh, a number of games like uh, Leisure Suit Larry 2 and Leisure Suit Larry 3, they were pretty much all about copyright protection up for about half, at least, of the game. Oh uh, yeah, now here's where we get the most annoying situation where... John Bo uh, starts giving you some hints about how to play this game. This game actually does give you its own in-game hints, as you can see here. You know, he's telling you to ask about, tell about, and show items and whatnot. I wouldn't call this hand-holding, per se. But it is one of the few games where they give you open hints about what you need to do in the game. And that only occurs if you haven't tried any of these things before. Now, if you did try, you know, talking to people about someone else, or asking about them, or telling them, or showing them items, he does not show up and tell you about that. So if you did all three of those things, you can skip that entirely. Now, here's where you learn that Sully and Lillian have something of a friendly relationship with each other. <clears throat> but, you don't get to see much of that in this run. Walk across the hall to see our next victim. Okay, he's not here yet. Which only goes to show that uh, he has to be somewhere else. And we go through the Colonel's study. Now, I recall at one point that you could open the uh, globe here and find a bunch of old used cigars. But I have not actually been able to do that, so I don't know if this was just a different game that I'm thinking about, or uh, if it never happened in any of the games, or if it just happens to be one of those features that got taken out when they converted this to CD. If any of you know, I'd like some confirmation on that. So now we start chasing after Wilbur and uh, Clarence. Really, I don't know exactly what they would think about Laura in this case, if she's just trying to get to another location in the house, or if she's a nosy girl who really needs to learn something about leaving people alone for their own private matters. That's what I would think of her anyway. She's just nosy, needs to leave people alone. Not really any reason for suspicion, right? And no, I don't actually go in there to see them. Again, we have another long wait. And why do we have this wait? Because we have to wait for Wilbur and Clarence to finish their conversation. And no, it doesn't actually matter in uh, these wait situations what order you do things in. It means that they could have a 15-minute conversation or a 45-minute conversation in a couple cases. You know, you just have to wait it out or eavesdrop on them. And that's really where the speed run comes in, actually eavesdropping on them to get them to leave the room faster. As you can see in real time, Wilbur's not left this room. And I, yes, I am deliberately avoiding going into various rooms at this point, just so it can be a true minimalist run and you can't see what others are doing 
if they're not important to the storyline at this point. So we wait, listening to the ticking and tucking of that clock, right? It gets a little lonely, watching the hours pass by. Oh, quit complaining. At least I didn't make the reference to the song, Let It Go. Okay, finally, they're not in here. And I think you actually have to see that they're not in that room before this can happen. <clears throat> now, we've seen Dr. Fields. Now, who actually trusts a doctor known as Dr. Fields? I don't know, it just doesn't sound right. And, of course, we've finished this off with the Gloria and Clarence picture. Again, these are just motives if you actually watch the uh, conversations that they have. This will show motives for who has to kill who. Which, uh, if you know who did this already, it's entirely irrelevant, actually. But we pass on here with Gloria listening to some song from another Sierra game, and the only reason it advances the clock is because Gloria's the next victim. This doesn't always make a whole lot of sense if you've played this for the first time. Like, why would you need to see that Gloria is sitting in the room listening to the Victrola? You know, other situations it might make more sense. Like, Wilbur's reading something. If you look at what he's reading, now, wait. <clears throat> Rudy and Clarence together. What a terrible choice for a roommate. <laughs> Don't you think? Rudy hates Clarence. Clater. Clarence hates Rudy. And they end up having to share a room together. <laughs> now, as I was saying, with this game, uh, it only really makes sense to you that the clock advances when you see somebody just sitting in the room only because uh, they might be doing something. Like, again, if you look at what Wilbur's reading, it advances a little bit of the plot since you know he has an interest in racehorses, which again is the false motive for committing murder. But when it comes to Gloria sitting there listening to the Trolla, there is no reason that should advance the plot, or advance the clock in any way, shape, or form. The only way you can tell why is if you've played through this game and you know she'll be the next one to die. In this case, technically you can avoid this uh, screen with the bell tower, but I chose not to. Now we get to the playhouse. Now the playhouse scenes are actually pretty important to the actual motive for murder. And if you think I spoiled it, then don't watch a walkthrough ever again then, right? But see, right here, this is where you can tell who the murderer is, if you're any good whatsoever. I mean, everybody else is acting a little cranky with one another. But this is the only time where you see somebody who seems to be truly crazy. So, seeing that uh, Lillian is acting truly crazy, you know that she's the one who's got the most uh, motive to kill people. And, oh wait, here you can see that the clock has been pulled out of the wall just a little bit. This is something that'll only happen if you haven't found the secret passages yet. Again, the game giving you in-game hints without truly holding your hand. <clears throat> so, now that we've passed all that up, we go to the next situation. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Okay, trying to find... Uh, Another little situation where we have, unfortunately, to wait. 
So we're waiting, waiting, listening to the tinkling of the chandelier, which inevitably will fall if you walk underneath it. Now, there's been speculation that it's actually the murderer who drops the uh, chandelier on you if you walk underneath it. Personally, I disagree with that. There is no way that the murderer could have done that to you. Now, they show the murderer on the bottom floor far too often. And if you look at the thing, how would you reach it anyway? You know, you can't stand on the railing. It breaks if you just lean on it a little. Finally, Ruby's is gone. So, really, that just happens to be a really bad coincidence. And, of course, we get the uh, fight between Fifi and Rudy. Now, the strange thing is, is if you observe this particular struggle with Fifi and Rudy, it does not go into the notes. You have to actually have uh, observed the first time that Rudy does this to get into the notes that these are people who f struggled physically. Which, really, I think uh, is pretty ill, well, since they were obviously struggling physically there. <laughs> On a side note, if any of you do these kind of uh, commentaries, please let me know, what do you do to keep your throats from drying out wh while making the commentaries? It's one of those major drawbacks for me doing these things, and... I would like some helpful hints on that. Um, back to the story. You may notice that I am actually avoiding going into the study. This is because at this point, if I go into the study, or the library, not the study, you'll find uh, evidence that something happened to Dr. Fields. And I am really going for the barely conscious thing here. In subsequent uh, situations, yeah, here's Clarence, and this one, if I may say, is the hardest one to get without getting the notes, because you have to catch both Clarence and Rudy before they meet, and, you know, it's like you can get a full 30 minute change before after meeting them, after they meet, but then you'll have it in the notes that they struggled physically. Also, uh, unfortunately, this part of the game is another lot of waiting, just because you have to wait for these wandering folks to finally catch up with you. So I caught Rudy, and now here comes the absolute worst one of them that I have to wait for, May I set the prone? <clears throat> As I was saying uh, about not seeing the crime scenes themselves, subsequent uh, acts do have that area cleaned up, like with uh, Gertie's murder. You go into the room uh, during Act 2, you'll see that there are signs of a struggle. If you go in there from Act 3 and beyond, it's all cleaned up. The same sort of thing goes with Dr. Fields, except you have to wait, I think, until Chapter 4 when Jeeves actually does a clean up. Well, finally, I found Ethel. Now, as far as uh, the bodies go, however, no, wait, here we are with Lillian. Rifling through the Colonel's weapons collection. Eh. It doesn't really... Again, this actually does uh, hold a lot of relevance. But you really do need to look through what's going on in that thing. You know, look through the cabinet, see what's in there, and take careful note on your own what is in there and later what's not in there. 
Now, as I was saying, the bodies don't actually uh, disappear until you find them, unless you get to Act 8. It turns out in Act 8, the bodies are removed from wherever they were. The one exception being Gloria. And Gloria won't be moved if and only if she turns out to have been uh, thrown into the well. In that particular case, you can raise the uh, well bucket and you'll see that Gloria is in the well. Now, this part that I just passed up with Rudy and Clarence, uh, it's a bit misleading since neither one of them dies and neither one of them's really doing anything. That seems to be worthwhile. Though I do question, why is Rudy eating dessert this late after dinner? And it's been hours since they had dinner. And he's just now eating dessert? Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and here's the Colonel talking to Lillian. This one almost uh, gives away Lillian's entire motive, which I'll get into later. But again, this only makes sense if you've eavesdropped on him. <clears throat> and yes, I am waiting for Lillian to show up in this room. Um, waiting for Lillian to show up in the bedroom. Then I realized she was not in the bedroom and I had to go check out on the colonel. Which this particular part just is there to show that the colonel can get up and leave his wheelchair. Again, not that big a revelation if you found the cane and you show it to... Fifi says that, yes, Henry sometimes uses a cane. Well, if the guy was truly confined to a wheelchair, he wouldn't have any need for a cane. There we saw Clarence uh, writing in his journal. There's uh, our next victim. Although, I have to say, him writing in his journal for an hour just to get the few sentences he put out there. That seems a bit excessive. And as we continue to wander through this estate, you will note that I am actively avoiding other rooms again, like the billiard room. Currently I'm avoiding the library. You know, and then there are other places that you'd never know that I was supposed to be there. You know, you won't notice that there's a carriage house. You won't notice that there's a stable. You know, which when you, we get to the section with the notes, it'll make these notes make no sense whatsoever. <clears throat> you know, this part of the game, where you have to knock at Sully's door, and she uh, tells you to get out of there, well, this was the hardest one for me to find when I first played this game, because I hadn't befriended Sully. I didn't know how to befriend her. I didn't know that she could befriend her, so I had no reason whatsoever to get to this cabin. So, yeah, I had to buy myself a hint book and finally discover that that was what you had to do to advance the level. <clears throat> In a way, I'd say that this was a poorly made game, at least in trying to figure out some puzzles. Here's Rudy, uh, with, along with the dog Beauregard. Which again can be misleading, since he doesn't seem to be doing anything important either. Yeah, Mills run this one's not very exciting, is it? <laughs> but it does go to show just how little you actually need to know and how little you actually need to do to truly finish the game. 
And this does mean that you technically lose the game at the end. But you have finished the game and it gives you a the end rather than giving you a uh, death scene. Yeah, a case in point for the death scene would be uh, the Perils of Rosella where you can get a bad ending. But it ends up as a uh, death scene since you have to restore, restart, or quit in that particular case. Which I do intend to do more minimalist runs. Uh, I am making a new channel where I will be doing minimalist runs, uh, death montages and such. Uh, if you have any requests currently just on minimalist runs, and please understand that these do have to be PC games since that's the only gaming system I have right now, uh, please let me know. Now here's where he's uh, written, I'm terribly apprehensive about what's going on here. I can't say why, just call it a bad sensation. But the, as the evening wears on, I'm feeling more and more alone. Where's Wilbur? Where's Gertie? Where's Gloria? Did they have left without me? Is there a way to leave the island that I'm not aware of? Still, the spine-chilling feeling won't leave. And frankly, I'm scared. And this is actually the uh, only crime scene that you have to see. And when I say crime scene, it means that you've found no body, just the crime scene. <clears throat> and actually seeing that I've avoided going into any of the rooms that these people should have been in, really, Laura is acting entirely on hunch in this run. Yeah, you know, it almost seems like she's just wandering around through the uh, estate, just kind of looking at things. Looking at things, checking out what's here or there, nosing around, seeing what other people are doing, without any real rhyme or reason to it. You know, you just imagine her as someone who's curiously exploring the estate, and blissfully unaware that anything's wrong. <laughs> Let me tell you, since this thing is made to be a play, if I sat through this play, I probably would have left long ago or demanded my money back. Now, this was the dead giveaway that it's Lillian. I mean, if you didn't know that it's Lillian after you saw those tally marks, then you really are not paying attention and would never be detective. I'm sorry, but you would never make detective. <clears throat> Now here's the chapel. This is the part that I always get nervous on when trying to make the minimalist run, because there are times when Wilbur will have been dumped off uh, here. Strangely enough, Sally will still be in this uh, chapel, whether or not Wilbur was dumped in this room. And if you hadn't found him before now, he will be in this room, and she will still be sitting there praying as if she didn't notice him somehow. Somehow, I find that hard to believe. If she can sense that something's wrong going here, she can see that body lying there on the floor. However, we've seen Sully. And truth is, out of all the characters in this game, Sully uh, is the only human to get out of it entirely unscathed. True, Laura can get out of it entirely unscathed as well, except she's your playable character. So Sully's the only non-playable human that gets out of this whole thing entirely unscathed. And truth is, there are numerous reasons for it, not just the obvious one. <clears throat> uh, basically... Here, wait, just a moment. Okay, here's where we find uh, Rudy trying to find something in this room. It's never revealed what he's looking for in this room. Never. Okay, anyway, uh, since there's not going to be much going on in the 8th chapter, let me explain why Sully would not be hurt. 
basically, a big part of this uh, that people are supposed to think about is that this is the colonel's bequest. You know, his um, writing the will, leaving the money to everyone. Except, uh, Sully is never mentioned to be someone who's getting the money. He says everyone's sitting at this table in the introduction, and Sally is not sitting at that table. She's not even in the room, for that matter. Yeah, so if anyone had a motive to kill just on, I don't want that person to get that money, I want the money, well, there's no reason to kill Sally because she's not even in the room, so she's obviously not getting any money. If it's one of the side motives that they mention, watch a different playthrough for that. Nobody ever mentions Sally. She doesn't have anything anyone wants, and nobody really cares anything about her. And finally, uh, since you know it's Lillian who's been doing the killing, Lillian actually likes Sally. <clears throat> Yeah, here is Lillian's dead body. This is where I messed up last time, actually searching Lillian. Turns out you don't have to search her. So, there's Lillian's dead body. And she's gone. Okay, now we're in for a long, long wait. So, to help this go a bit faster, let me explain some things. Again, Lillian liking Sully is part of it, but... The whole reason that uh, everybody was dying here was not because of jealousy from Clarence, who actually has the most motive to kill anyone. Uh, he's angry about uh, Gloria breaking up with him. He hates Rudy for wanting to get him away from Gloria. You know, Gertie won't, or not Gertie, uh, I think it's Gloria, or no, Ethel, who won't sell to him part of the land, and Wilbur's wanting to reveal a secret of them stealing money. But none of that has anything to do with it. You know, even people thinking, oh, that's not a blood relative, he doesn't deserve money, that has nothing to do with it. What it is, is that Lillian, ever since her father ran out on her, pretty much lived a life of neglect and unloved. She also had a very strong feeling of betrayal from those who were around her. So when she came here t with all her relatives around her, and she hears she's only getting an equal share, and he's pretty much treating her, the colonel is treating her like he does everyone else, and it's great to see you again, Lillian. And spending more time with Lillian, she went insane with jealousy. I mean, this is what set it off. So, stuck with the fear that she's being abandoned by the Colonel, and this belief that she's been betrayed by everyone around her, this is where she finally gets so angry that she's just going to kill off everyone. So then the colonel's hers and hers alone. As far as uh, her intended victims go, everybody who died here was probably an intended victim except for Jeeves. She's never shown doing anything around Jeeves. Jeeves hasn't <coughs> actually done anything uh, to indicate that he's got anything to do with turning the colonel against her. And it turns out that he's killed off uh, the same time that Beefy is. So, my theory on what happened there is that Lillian had poisoned the Cognac with the intent of killing off Fifi, and Jeeves just happened to be a casualty of that one since he too drank of the Cognac and got poisoned there. It's really combining alcohol with... Uh, Sleeping pills, that is a fatal combination. Now, getting back to where we are in the game, you probably saw the uh, message saying the cry and pain of anger, or pain and anger rendered the night air. 
That's what I was waiting for. It means you took too long and the kernel is dead. And as you can see, uh, without the key, the door is just open. So sit back and enjoy the ending for now. <coughs> absolute lowest you can get on that thermometer. <clears throat> so let's review our notes uh, just to see how poorly I really did here. Nope, nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing there. Well, looks like I found one person at least. exchange location thing either. Now here are the hints. What you'll find here is that a lot of these things are actually just repeats of certain things like Sully. A kernel may not be such a bad guy. Yeah. 
Like the monocle, unless you actually got the monocle, that means no sense here. <laughs> well, yeah, she's tell you the same thing. Really search the kitchen? No. Now the carriage house again. You didn't actually know there was a carriage house. And you didn't find this noteworthy, which actually taking notes is the same thing as an automatic thing. see though that they've told you to eavesdrop twice now. Here they pretty much give away that Rudy was the murderer. And see, and here we go again with Sully. And there's more eavesdropping. And once again, they've just given away that it was Rudy. 